That's what it's all about, isn't it? This coming together, together as all people and together within ourselves, these energies of masculine and feminine supporting one another. That's what this whole series has been all about. And this is the last of our three-week series, but it's not the last of, of the theme because it's a theme that continues to run through our lives and we keep reminding one another of what needs to come up and what needs to come into balance and support with in order for us to really experience the divine wholeness and the human wholeness, the human divine wholeness, if you will, the coming together of all these pieces and parts of the journey. So on this last leg of the journey, um, I wanna talk a little bit about ritual. And um, I kind of surprised myself with the theme, well, I, or I guess spirit surprised me with a the theme. <laughs> and I thought, well, I don't know really what I'm gonna say about ritual. And then of course, like a lot of things, once I got into it, it's like, oh wow, we could do like 10 weeks on ritual. <laughs> how rich, how fun. Um, and it brought me back actually, and it may bring you back to some experiences you've had in your own life where you've really touched that very sacred divine through some kind of mystical experience that can be a very physical experience, which is a lot of what ritual is, is the physical combined. You know, it's the mundane and the sacred together. It's the mundane infused with sacred, sacredness, sacred intention, prayerful intention. Sometimes it just sweeps us away though, you know, spirit just takes us on a journey. <laughs> and that was the experience that I had um, on this particular story I wanna share with you in my 20s, you know, a time when we are kind of finding ourselves, right, is a typical, it certainly was true for me. Anybody have the experience, still have the experience? <laughs> Did then and still do, which is great. It just means you're on the journey, always evolving, right? But this was a time in particular that I was kind of seeking what is mine to do and I had uh, lost a job and it, it wasn't feeding me and it wasn't true, it wasn't a good job for me. Um, but I was also just kind of looking and I started grad school and I'd recently, fairly recently found Unity. Um, and I was working on, as a freelancer, I got a job um, writing, I was in PR, so I was writing press releases for this Black, Save the Black Rhino campaign in Africa. And I just got lit up over this, you know? It was just like, wow, this is like something I can really get behind and care deeply about and feel passionate about. At the same time, in my new Unity experience, I was reading The Course in Miracles, which told me everything in life is an illusion. And I wanted to hurl that thing across the room. Anybody have that experience with The Course in Miracles? <laughs> yeah, two hands in the back. <laughs> So it was like a mix of all these things, right? And so one day I went to drop off my um, press releases at my employer's office. And instead of turning around and going back the way I came back home, my feet were just directed, you know, in a way that like I couldn't deny. It was just like, okay, where are we going? You know? <laughs> and I was marched down the street and take a left and take a right and into this used bookstore I'd never been in, which by the way was Powell's Used Books, which is my last name kind of interesting. And immediately, I'm a browser, so normally I will take my time in a bookstore, but I was just immediately directed, go back in the store in this little corner, turn around, look up, there's the book, take it home. <laughs> and it was Reinventing Eve by Kim Chernin. And as I opened the pages and read the first story, she tells of a dream, and in the dream there's all this imagery of, as dreams are, very vivid dream, of um, her notebook being below the window and the window opens up and a squirrel comes in and it walks in the ink on the page and then it goes out and then she finds herself out um, digging in the dirt and she comes back and she's shaping this clay figure and she gets that it's the woman who is not yet. Of course she is shaping herself, but it's something bigger than that, what she's shaping there, you know? And so she said it was so vivid that when she woke up, she immediately looked over and the window was closed, there were no ink prints, there was no sign, and then she looked at her hands and her hands were dirty <laughs> with mud or soil. So these experiences, these mystical experiences, it opens me to that whole realm in a whole new way. And during the time I was reading the book, I find myself being awoken at like 4.44 in the morning or sometime around 4 something that was near that time 
regularly, like night after night. And that was, you know, I was a sound sleeper and 4 a.m. was middle of the night to me. So, you know, so that was a very odd kind of uh, new thing for me. And then I also found myself just automatically doing these sort of ritualistic things. I would begin to put candles in the windowsill and rocks and sacred items. And, you know, it was, I was in big city of Chicago living in an apartment building. Outside my window was another brick building, you know, that was like, this wasn't like, you know, I wasn't like dancing in the moonlight in the fields, you know. <laughs> but God can penetrate anywhere, right? <laughs> And so, it, but what was so interesting about this, and then I would be, you know, guided off, and I, I mean, it was like everything was just an, an automatic. Anybody have these experiences before? I know some of you have, right? So you're just being taken, right? So then I'd be taken to the kitchen, and I'd make eggs, you know, all the while my sister, my roommate's still sleeping, and I'd sit mindfully at the table and eat my eggs, and then I'd go back to bed. And so this was just happening night after night for some time, and then it just stopped. But, but during that time, it was that, that touching in of that really, um, that experience that you've just been brought on a ride, you know, on that magic carpet you just sang about. It's that kind of experience, you know. But the ritual, which was so fascinating to me, it was the ritualizing and the movement and the actions and the making of the building of these altars um, that I was doing and the preparing of the food and the way that I was eating the food and the food that I was guided to make, all of it felt like it was part of this grand ritual. And as I was doing these things, I felt so deeply connected to lost ancestry, you know, so deeply connected to tribal sisters and tribal brothers. It was a kind of um, bringing forth something lost in us, lost in me. And I believe lost for us, but easily found. And easily found through ritual. That we can infuse our lives with this very simply. But there, first we have to look at why we don't. <laughs> it's always important to look at why we don't. When I start my prayer classes, we almost always look at this article on why don't we pray and talk about ourselves the reasons why we don't pray instead of why we do pray. We kind of know why we do pray, but we don't always look at why we don't. And it's almost always the same reasons that we all come up with collectively. There's not enough time in our perception. We don't really know how to pray or pray correctly or pray affirmatively or pray whatever it is that we think we have to pray a certain way and we don't know how. We don't really think it's very effective. We don't really want to get quiet and still and face the stuff that's going on inside of us. It's easy to remain distracted in this world with a zillion things, right? So easier just to open up the computer and surf the net or get into social media or whatever it is that might distract us from what is really true inside for us. So for some of us, prayer becomes an elimination of the distraction and therefore a facing of what is up. <laughs> Or we don't really, really want the transformation that is available for us because it might upset the apple cart of our lives, the way things are going. You know, even though there's a part of us that knows in our heart of hearts, we want to be continually evolving on the spiritual path. There is a sense, maybe a part of us that resists. So for all the same reasons that we resist prayer, we resist the idea of ritual and more. <laughs> because ritual in our rationally minded world is not really seen as very reasonable or sophisticated, right? It might even seem a little primitive. And so it's easy to kind of dismiss it and say, well, that's, that's kind of like child's play, right? Or it's a little silly or it's, you know, just it doesn't feel very, well, masculine, does it? <laughs> and therefore acceptable. So there's that kind of sense of it's, it's not, you know, it's not that significant. And so we have to overcome then or look at that if we want to enact more ritual in our lives or at least just try it out, just experiment with it a little bit. And so, you know, why do we need it? Well, let me count the ways. <laughs> um, one of the, you know, 
130 years ago almost, Unity was founded by Charles and Myrtle Fillmore. And our, our very grounding of what we are about in Unity is about shifting our thinking to the divine, right? Getting into the feeling space as well, but really shifting out of where we believe ourselves to be less than or something other than divine or Christed consciousness and to, to, sh to change our thinking, to allow ourselves to let go of those beliefs of lack and limitation that are not of the truth and to line ourselves up with what is true, what is whole, what is real about who we are as spiritual beings. But you know, back 130 years ago, we did not process anywhere near the amount of information we now process today. UCSD recently did a study, Roger Bond was the head researcher, and in it they found that the human brain on average processes 34 gigabytes of information per day. They said that's enough in one week to completely overload a laptop. It could make it, render it unuseful. <laughs> and so we are today working with a lot of information and a lot of access to information and therefore a lot of mental clutter and material clutter for that matter, right? So there's a lot to cut through that maybe our foremothers and fathers didn't deal with to quite the same level that we do. So ritual is the, these ancient ways of, and prayerful, you know, prayer and ritual go hand in hand, intentional ways that we can cut through some of that clutter, that we can help ourselves if we incorporate ritual into our everyday lives, we may choose these meaningful, prayerful, intentional rituals over some of the wasted time on Facebook. I'm not saying it's all a waste. Because, you know, our, our technological genius is that. It's genius. It's innovative. It's fabulous. It's just a little bit of an overload, it seems. And all of the information, you know, all the rest. It's not just about that. So, so it's about kind of clearing the path, you know, letting go of the stuff that's in the way. And, and by ritualizing, by bringing ceremony into our lives in rich ways, we can really slow all that down and declutter and open the space for the heart to be you know, ignited and for the, the body to be incorporated into the prayer and for the mind to be opened and decluttered. So these are all helpful ways. And you might think, well, we don't really practice ritual in unity. Oh, well, let me tell you. Let me tell you a few of the ways that we do. You know, just this last year, we had a remembrance ceremony and a solstice ceremony. And then we had a Christmas Eve candle lighting that we do every year. And we hold our candles high in the whole room as we sing Silent Night, Holy Night. And then on New Year's Eve, we have a burning bowl ceremony where we write down what we want to release and we put it in the fire. And then we write letters to ourselves. And then on the first Sunday of the year, we, we do the white stone ritual where we write a guiding word or quality for our year on a stone that comes to us through meditation. During Easter this year, we did a communal, communion ritual with the physical elements of bread and grapes and the metaphysical meaning of that imbued into that experience. You know, soon we're going to have a solstice celebration. Today we're going to do a ritual. I'll tell you about that you're invited to join in after service. So we do have a lot of ritual. Every service, you know, we hold hands. We sing the peace song as we close. And unity churches all over the world do that. You know, so it, it's, it's, it's here. <laughs> it's here. It's in our lives. You may not be individually incorporating it into your lives or your families or your organizations, and we could probably bring more into our community experience. So, you know, on Mother's Day this year, we also had another ritual, Mother's Day weekend, Ida Risi Alit came, the high priestess of Bali, and she brought lots of ritual, rich divine feminine energy to us that's about the Balinese way, which is beauty, which is devotion. Um, we had a water blessing ceremony. We had chanting and ringing of the bell and, and uh, meditation and a raising up of the energy. And after that experience, what I have experienced is that 
A trauma that has lived here in this community for over 30 years is gone. And that is the death of Carol Ruth Knox. Yeah. It feels gone to me. I don't, does anybody else feel that clean energy, that renewal, that rebirth that is present? It feels so rich and present to me now. And so today's ritual is about sealing that in around our property. And so we did half the property this morning at nine, after the 9.30 a.m. service, and we invite the re whoever wants to join after this service to seal up the rest of the property with this ritual blessing of the water, not as release now, but as saturation of blessing and rose petals of saturation of blessing from our whole community. So um, maybe a little bit more about that later. Um, in Bali, everyday life is, is devotional like this. Ritual is a part of everyday life. People spend an enormous portion of their wages, I forgot what the percentage is, but it's really high, for offerings, for um, the making of the baskets, the gathering of the fruits and the flowers and the foods that they bring to temple. But they also, every day, put out in their own homes, at the doorsteps, in the doorsteps of businesses along the streets. And so it's a constant ritualistic pattern. The women spend a huge portion of their time preparing these offerings. They often look much like this with flower petals and herbs and other gifts that we give over to, to the divinity within, the divinity in the allness of life. Now, I'm not suggesting that we become like another culture and completely mimic these ways of being, but what I am suggesting is that we could learn from some of these other cultures of simple ways that we could imbue our lives with the sacred through ritual and ceremony. And it's simple, you know, this is in our DNA, it's in our ancestral bones, we know this. We know the beauty of interacting with the elements of nature and with each other to create connection with spirit, with each other, and, and with all that is alive and well. We know how to bring this in. It's just a matter of opening our minds and hearts and trying it out and maybe pushing up against a little bit of the resistance that might come, that might say whatever it says to you that it in some way is not okay. Sabonfu Somme, uh, Sabonfu Somme is a, um, was a teacher who came from West Africa, part of the Dagari tribe. She lived in Sacramento and um, she actually made her transition a couple years ago, but some, some are familiar with her from a lot of grief ritual that she did with people, but other ritual Actually, that was what her gift was in bringing to the West, was to teach people in the US and around the West um, ritual from the, her tribal um, traditions. And she would talk about how here in the US, her life was filled with schedules and planes and you know, have to be here and have to be there and prepare this and prepare that and papers and so on. You, know, you probably could relate to some of this, calendars and times and travel and so on. And she said when she'd go home, she didn't have anything to do. <laughs> and it was so lovely. <laughs> and she said she'd also talk to her, her brothers and sisters from the tribe about how um, in America there was so much stuff. Like our homes are filled with stuff and our cars are filled with stuff and everywhere is filled with stuff. And they would shake their heads, you know, and say, why? Why so much stuff? I don't understand the stuff. You know, it's like, why, why would you need more than your, your relationships and, and the beauty all around you and a few simple items to make your life, you know, easier? Why would you need all that stuff? So it's a good question to ask ourselves, isn't it? Because I didn't, don't have a good answer um, to it when I ask myself that question, and yet I continue to be in that kind of lifestyle. And so we like comfort and we, you know, there, we could come up with lots of reasons, but it's a good thing to just think about once in a while. And how if we were to remove some of the stuff, how much energy we free, right? How much energy we free in ourselves, in our minds, in our homes, in our workplaces, and so on. So ritual, how does it work? This, this idea, you know, of taking maybe twigs or stones or fire, 
candles, you know, simple things, you know, simple things that we can do to incorporate it into our lives, you know. We can start our day and end our day with ritual, maybe begin our day with an intentional prayer and light a candle uh, for what it is that we want to do that day. What is our divine purpose today? What is the intention we're walking out the door with? And maybe if you live with others, you could do this together. You could find a time that works for everyone to come together and share your prayerful intentions and light a candle and begin your day that way. And then when you come home, maybe even before you enter home, you could have a way of, of letting go of the world, you know, cleansing somehow, maybe using some water to douse your head or your third eye or your heart or your hands to say, thank you for the service, you know, the opportunity to serve. And now, now I come into a place of, of home, of sanctuary and home, of connection with home. Or maybe you're going back out into the world to be part of meetings or some, somehow creating something in the world. So, but every time there is this kind of coming and going, there could be a ritual of some kind that you incorporate into your life. You're gathering around together to share a meal. Or if you live alone, invite some neighbors over, you know, to have that sense of warmth and community and heart-to-heart -heart connection to break bread together. These are all rituals we do anyway. I mean, the, the meals anyway. And so we can ritualize our meals a little bit more by making a point of having them together to share the highlights of our day or some area that we might need some support. It creates that kind of, builds that kind of connection and intimacy that this divine feminine principle that we've been talking about is all about. It's all about relationship, about connection and collaboration and communication. And we can certainly all benefit from all of those, can't we? So, you know, rituals can also transform us. The ritual itself can not only declutter our minds and bring freedom and clarity, a sense of intentional purpose through our prayer, but it can also actually transform us in the midst of the ritual itself. Gay uh, Williamson and David Williamson wrote a book together. David uh, is a unity minister. Gay is a psychotherapist. And it, this is an old book in 1994. It's called Transformational Rituals, Celebrations for Spiritual or for Personal Growth. And they had all these different ideas about different rituals. And one of the things that they do is a very simple thing that probably uh, the YOUers do at Rally and we've done at our own retreats. But they would always end their retreat, excuse me, with an appreciation circle. And in the appreciation circle, of course, one by one, everybody is sort of loved up and appreciated for the gifts that they bring. They talk about this one young man, his name was Ken, and Ken stuttered. It seemed like he had everything going for him in his life, but this was an area that was difficult for him, that he would always stutter when he went to say something. And so, of course, it created a lot of, you know, uncomfortable sort of wiggling around for him, for others, a frustration for him. But that day, he was transformed by the ritual. So after he was all loved up with all the appreciation and it was his turn to speak, he spoke with just complete eloquence. Not one pause, not one stutter. And everybody was amazed and questioning, you know, but the questioning brought no answers because it was a touching of that d divine, that sacred mystery that, you know, that, that can't be explained by the mind. And from then on, Ken spoke with confidence and even glibness. He never stuttered again. So it is through even these simple rituals that we can come together and heal and transform ourselves, our communities, and each other. So t just t to share a little bit more of uh, today's ritual, what we'll do after the service is over is there won't be a receiving line, but anybody who wants to be a part will meet out on the lawn. And then you can uh, take some rose, I'll pass around, we can take some rose petals and we'll infuse those with our blessings. This is all about blessing this community, blessing unity of Walnut Creek, blessing our grounds, sealing in the energy from this whole time that we've been working with the divine feminine since um, the Mother's Day weekend when Ida arrived and, and did the blessing 
to this Wednesday when David Best will come and, and work with us on, on divine feminine and masculine balance and close out this time. So it's a, it's a sealing in, a sort of saturating in with the, our prayers, with our footsteps, the whole perimeter of our property. So whoever wants to be a part of that will just meet on the lawn right after service. So you know, in truth, what we are all doing is shaping the human that is not yet. You know, the human that, that is a part of this like, deep ancestry, this indigenous tribal understanding of ceremony and the ways that, uh, of being that we might call more feminine. And this genius, this innovative technological intelligence that we have brought forth that we might call the masculine and bringing these together, weaving them together, lifting them up. We really have to raise up, though, the divine feminine that has been hidden and lost and dismissed and really even ridiculed back into her sacred place so that we ourselves individually and holistically can be that very thing, balanced and whole. Balanced and whole in our community, balanced and whole in our world, bringing harmony to the earth in maybe a way that it never has before. Perhaps we are shaping not only ourselves of the human who is not yet, but something bigger than that in all of humanity. It's a gift that we are able to give because we have the conscious awareness to do so. So I want to really invite you into ritual this week, into trying it out, practicing it at home. Just go with your heart. See what guides you and make a ritual and see what happens after that. Who knows? It's part of the mystery, part of the fun. So as we raise up this divine feminine together, we affirm together that there is balance and harmony and wholeness. And let's do that together in this affirmation. I raise up the divine feminine energy within me, restoring wholeness, balance, and harmony in myself and the world. And so it is. <laughs>